So I wanted to give a summary, an experiential summary of contemplative prayer, specifically centering prayer. And what I mean by experiential summary is we've often before looked at the Christian theology behind us. We've looked at Bible verses. Um, we've looked at the, hey, where does this fit into the faith aspect? But I, I'm just going to share it from the point of view of how I experience it every day. Um, and hopefully that's a blessing to you guys. But I also want to share not just about the prayer itself, but how it fits into what we understand by prayer as Christians and also the contemplative lifestyle, which means how do we walk in God's presence um, minute by minute in our days. And, you know, since I, in my career, I had the great privilege of taking a sabbatical in 2007 and we'd achieved quite a bit of success business-wise. And, you know, I, I noticed on my sabbatical that that success didn't make me any happier. Uh, the wealth it brought didn't make me any better. Um, and I decided back then in 2007 that my life's dream is to find a way of living in God's presence, living in this heavenly realm on this earth. And I really think this contemplative prayer is the key to it. So that's what I want to briefly talk about now. Um, so let's look at the practice first. The practice of centering prayer begins like this. Um, uh, twice a day. For a minimum of 20 minutes is the recommendation you do the following. And, and I'll just pause there and say, you might say, oh, boy, I don't have 20 minutes. Uh, 20 minutes is such a long time. Um, anything is helpful. My little 15-year-old, actually, he's not that little anymore. He comes up and he asks to join me and he joins for 10 minutes. And that's certainly very helpful. But I think the analogy is like this. When you are doing two times 20 minutes, you're digging a well. You, you, you're actually digging into your own heart and accessing a source of God, of presence, uh, of the Holy Spirit that grows and grows and grows. Whereas when you're doing less than that, you, you're getting occasional benefits um, and maybe you're drinking from somebody else as well. But I, 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 there is kind of a tipping point at two times 20 minutes. So highly encourage to, that you kind of make that investment and try and get that into your life. I, I will say that my life has often turned out to be one chunky session in the mornings, like I'm at 30 minutes in the mornings. And then after that, it just pieces together. I might do a 10 minute and then another 20 minute before bed. And that's kind of how I try to get it together. And I'll be honest, I, I, often have days where I don't get two times 30 minutes, which is my goal. Um, but then the other thing you can do is, and I highly recommend, is you can go on a retreat or you can take a Friday afternoon or something and do more. And those really take like an excavator to this well of digging down and creating more space for the fluid, for the, the liquid of presence, like a dam in your life. Uh, with greater depths when when you take those retreats so what do we what happens in this 20 minutes or 30 minutes um the first thing is to get comfortable um uh you know sitting upright is the way most people do this uh, you can't have your spine bent you've got to sit up to to have just a clear free flow of breath um it's really important for some reason um, and i think some of those reasons are mystical why it's important to have your chest straight. I uh, often have kind of, uh, my stomach gets knotted and so sitting upright is not fun. And so I lie down with my back straight. So the main thing is a straight back, but I mean, honestly, I've, I've spent many hours doing this in an airplane seat or in an airport or wherever. And so it really does work everywhere. And the more, almost the more variation you have, the more you're rewiring your brain in different situations, but you get comfortable. And it begins with saying your sacred word. And your sacred word is short for a prayer that says, Christ, I welcome your presence and your action. So, in other words, you want to experience God, experience God, not just have thoughts about God, experience God, and you want to have God change you. Uh, I, I 
read this quote recently that said, um, by someone said, when I was young, I was smart and I wanted to change the world. Now I'm old and I'm wise and I've learned that I need to change myself. Uh, you know, changing the world is mostly about changing ourselves because the world can be such a beautiful and amazing place when we have the right shift inside of us. And that's, that's what this prayer is. It's Christ, I consent to your presence and I consent to your action. And, um, and the word consent as part of the meaning of the sacred word is really crucial because consent means surrender. And what you're really saying is, is, is not so accurate to say, Christ, I invite your presence and your action or come with your presence and your action because God's presence is already at work inside of us. Uh, Augustine said, um, you were there all along inside of me, but I was away. And, and what's actually going on when we go through uh, busy, hectic, stressed, anxious lives, when we fall into anger, hate, fear, what's actually happening is we are away from God. God is right there in us, but we've moved out almost into this fake false world. And so when you say, I consent to your presence and action, that's the more accurate thing. God's presence and action are already in us, and we just surrendering to it. So we are, in a sense, giving up, saying, I'm willing to give up the obstacles to experiencing your presence, to experiencing your transforming work inside of me. And that's what the sacred word is short for. So my sacred word is presence. The sacred word itself doesn't have a meaning. It's just short for this prayer. And so you say that sacred word in your heart. And then what do you do? And to be honest, I kind of, for, for the first two, three years of my practice, I often thought, well, what am I doing now? The reality is you're doing nothing. And that's exactly what God wants you to do is nothing. But it's actually very hard. But it's very profound to do nothing because in doing nothing, you're resting, you're receiving, and you're making space for God. And you're proving that your value is just to be. Your value is not to do. And, and contemplative prayer is the highest form of receptive prayer where you do nothing. At, and it's an entire reliance on grace to do everything. There are other forms of prayer where you do a lot more, um, especially prayer where you speak or where, where, where you conceptualize. But in this prayer, you're really just trying to do nothing. But I, I might say to you, hey, Bob, say the sacred word and then do nothing. And you still think, well, but what is exactly is doing nothing? I, 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 I don't know what to do. I, I've learned that the best way of thinking about that is to pay attention. So you say the sacred word, and then you become aware. You pay attention but to nothing specific. And you aware and attentive, and you're actually concentrating, because you don't just want to drift off and let a thought come and you climb onto a thought. You're actually paying attention to be aware of everything that's going on. And that's the great mystery of it. That's the heart of this practice is that awareness, that attention. And Thomas Keating, the, the kind of the founder, the, the, the father of centering prayer, speaks of it as a loving awareness. So it's almost like you've prayed this prayer through the sacred word, and now you're lovingly waiting for God. You're resting in God. You but you're aware, you're aware, sharp as you're doing that. And then I almost think of it as one of three things happen, okay? And let's go through each of those three things. Again, this is experiential, and maybe this doesn't seem to be so for you or for others, but in my experience now, kind of coming up for six years on this, um, one of three things happen when I've said the sacred word and I've become aware. The first thing that might happen is that I might, my awareness might get carried away by thoughts. 
uh, particularly juicy thoughts, compelling thoughts. So lately for me, it's been about the soccer game that I played recently and how I almost scored a goal or how I failed to make a good pass. Or, you know, you know for somehow for me, soccer is a bit like being out hunting and, and it's just gripping. And so I'm there praying and the soccer game is going. But that seems a bit innocuous. Most of the time, the thoughts that grab you are linked to your brokenness. They've linked to your false self. So, for example, if your false self really needs uh, the affection and attention of other people, then a distracting thought that will come up is a recent event when you might have failed in getting the attention and, and affirmation of people or when you successfully did or some plan to get the affirmation uh, of someone. Again, if that's your false self or if your false self is an unhealthy need for control, often it's some thought process linked to how am I going to get more control that takes over your thinking. So that's the first thing that can happen as you've said the sacred word and as you've waited there is something else grabs your attention. So what do you do? Well, I think you know the answer is you return to the sacred word. You return to God. It's a great blessing. And the spiritual muscle, every time the spiritual muscle lets go of something, lets go of that thought and returns to God, it's a powerful act that strengthens your devotion to God. And so you say the sacred word again, and you return. And it's a good thing, not a bad thing. If that happens a thousand times in the prayer, then you've worked out that muscle a thousand times. And so, you, you know, don't say, oh, I'm terrible at this. No, you've just done a hundred, a thousand push-ups, spiritually speaking. Um, but... Uh, but I want to emphasize two things that really work here when you return, when you've been carried away and you return. And that is say your sacred word gently and say it slowly. Again, you're doing this in your heart. You're not doing it with your mouth. But do it gently and do it slowly. And let me explain. By gently, I mean don't beat yourself up. Don't, try, don't get frustrated. Just be kind to yourself. Um, if you beat yourself up and get frustrated, you actually take one step even further away from God's presence. Whereas if you just gently accept, ah, oh, I'm growing and God's patient with me and you say it gently. Uh, Thomas Keating says it's like, it's like placing a feather on a piece of cotton wool. If you can do it so gently, so gently return to God, it, 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 it optimizes your spiritual condition as opposed to getting angry. Ah! And then, you know, it's almost like by doing that, you've, you've, you've jumped right into the middle of the highway, almost got knocked over by a car called frustration, and then try to get back on the side of the highway and, 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 and get back into meditation. So don't do it with frustration and anger. Um, and then the second thing is slowly. This is a great secret because sometimes what happens is we get carried away by a thought and we're drifting off thinking about the soccer game and something flashes in our mind that, hey, I'm carried away. And it's almost like you half say the sacred word. It's just like presence. That's my sacred word, presence. But you haven't actually let go of that thought about the soccer. And so... Think about yourself more as taking five, ten seconds even to say, wait, 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 wait. I want to think about soccer. Say my sacred word. And, and, and there's a kind of a focus with which you choose God again, which the meaning of the sacred word comes from your heart. So it's not just a quick thought of the sacred word, oh, but then you're still thinking about soccer, if you know what I mean. So slowly and gently. And um, and so that's the first thing that can happen. Your attention can be carried away. And, and that is the thing that will happen most of the time, um, at least for as long as you get up to my level, because I can't speak for levels beyond that. The second thing that can happen, and this is a beautiful, beautiful thing, is that you can have a continuous time. 15 seconds, 30 seconds, one minute, two minutes, 
and your desire should be for this to be as long as possible, where you just remain aware and you don't allow thoughts to carry you away. And that, friends, is eternity. That is a place of God's presence. And it might happen within 10 seconds. It might happen within two minutes. But a joy, a peace, a warmth, a love, I want to say rises up, but that's the wrong word. It's already there in your spirit because God's already there with all of his love, all of his joy, all of his peace. But you become tuned into it. So after a time of just being aware, it's almost like God begins to saturate the, the pores of your inner man. And your awareness of that increases. So in other words, if you, if you allow your awareness and you're concentrating and you're sharp and your awareness is not being carried away by distractions, then by, by default, your awareness of God, of his presence, of, of his action, his transforming work in you just rises up. And that is the goal. That is the pure treasure of contemplative prayer and, frankly, of the whole spiritual experience of, of the Christian walk. Um, and my fear is, having said it now to you like this as an experience, this has been my experience, that you might say, oh, but I don't actually feel that warmth, and so for me it, it's not real. It can often be the most subtle, subtle, subtle of experiences and it's not even to the point of not being an experience but in your the deepest depths of your soul it feels healthy even if it feels dry and for many people it's been known to feel like there, there isn't a feeling um, but but even so even if there isn't a feeling it's an amazing thing to just be aware, but not aware of thoughts. And it almost feels at time like you're walking on water when it's like that. Like I often catch myself and I'm, I, I think I'm doing it. I'm doing it. This is like amazing. Like I'm walking in heaven because I'm aware, but I'm not aware. It's not that I'm aware of the soccer game. And what you're truly aware of there is the depths of God that can't be known by the mind. And that's why this is so powerful. So that's the second thing that can happen. And I'm going to come back to something to do. Maybe, maybe this is wrong, but again, my experience on that second thing. The third thing that can happen, and this is very precious, and it's more common, is you can be very aware and you, you have thoughts but you're not carried away by them. So you're aware that you're having thoughts, but those thoughts aren't gripping you and taking your attention. It's almost like your spiritual arm is holding on to God, but your mind is ticking away over here with thoughts. And, and that's very, very powerful and very transformative because what's happening is you are actually in your spiritual space. You're in your awareness. Your awareness is the spiritual realm, your spiritual nature, your consciousness, and it's above thought. So what often happens is you sitting here, I'm just putting it here above my head on this video, it's actually in there, but you hear and your thoughts are happening, but you're not carried away by them, you're looking down on them. And why that's so powerful and so transformative is because anything you're aware of can't control you. So even if the thoughts you're having come from your false self, thoughts about how can I get affection from other people, because that's my false self. That's how I look for love in the wrong places, is try and get other people to like me. And I'm having thoughts like that. But I'm not carried away by them. It's almost like I'm rooted here in silence, in awareness, and I notice that. Then that thing begins to lose its power. In your life and that's how transformation happens um it's 
I suppose a bit like Paul said in the book of Ephesians, we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. It's like you're above what's happening in this world. And so, like I say, to summarize, three things happen. You get carried away by thoughts. You are able to be aware and thoughts that just aren't there. And you get experiences of what's deeply inside your spirit. Or you, you stay locked into God in awareness, but you're aware of your thoughts without them dislodging you, as it were, from God. In that number two and number three, there's no need to say the sacred word. That's where you want to be. If number one is happening a lot, remember what I said, that it's not to say, oh, Rob said one of three things could happen, but number one's happening most of the time, and I hardly get number two, and even when I do, I don't feel anything, and number three hardly comes. Remember, just the exercise of number one is like spiritual push-ups, provided you say the sacred word slowly and gently. And so, folks, that's the practice. Uh, what I'll add to that is, as you end, don't jump up from your chair. Um, that's why I have the three gongs, you know, and I let, I, I, I try to discipline myself to allow the whole three gongs, which is probably about a minute, minute and a half to finish before I jump up. And, and there's something about the transition from the prayer time to normal life where you kind of carry it with you, where it's very good to try to uh, not hasten that. And so that, that's really it. That's the practice. And I'll very quickly touch on how this fits into Christian prayer and into the contemplative lifestyle. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It just occurred to me that there's a progression there, heart, soul, mind, and strength from the inside to the outside. The deepest part of you is your heart. The next deepest part of you is your soul. Then comes your mind and finally comes your body. And this is prayer at the deepest level, prayer in the heart. And I, at times, one time got confused and thought, ah, oh, all I need is this. And don't worry about saying the Lord's Prayer or praying with my wife or any, none of that counts. No, God wants, as Jesus said, for us to love him with every level of our being. But I'm sad that I didn't learn about this prayer earlier. I only learned prayers of the mind. The idea of picturing God in my mind and using my words and putting my arms up, which is my body, right? But I'm glad I've learned about this space of communicating with God in the deepest part beyond words. Um, but it fits together with all the other parts. And so don't stop praying audibly. Don't stop thinking about Bible verses. Those are all part of loving God with your mind. And, and of course, learning how to love God with the body is a very interesting area that, frankly, Christianity hasn't been very good at. Um, and we, we're learning uh, and we're exploring that. And then finally, I'll just say, if you're doing the centering prayer, then there's a few other practices that uh, I'll just mention two of them that help to make this a powerful thing in your whole life. The first is <clears throat> when you do this, it's best in, for the morning session, it's best to not have done a ton of business first. The perfect day is a day when you wake up, you don't pick up your cell phone and read the news and check your texts. You almost close off that part of the world. And you only do that after your prayer. Maybe you go outside, you get a bit of outdoor uh, light. And maybe you, you, you know, jump in the shower or something like that. But the first time you engage is with this prayer. Those are my best days. Uh, the second thing is, in, before each prayer, I, I, I found it's much more effective if I read a little bit of Thomas Keating or the Bible, and, and just even just for a few minutes, and it gets me into a spiritual mode. Um, and then the final thing I've, I've, I've shared with you guys before about noticing, what this does is in the prayer time, it makes you so much more aware but you can take that awareness out and be in the spirit and walk in God's presence for most of the day by taking moments to notice. So when something strikes you, let more things strike you during the day. And then just take five or 10 seconds 
to experience them, not think about them, not analyze them, not say, oh, that tree is beautiful because it's green, but just to feel the beauty. And that can even be with negative situations in your life, like something, an aggressive driver pulls in front of you and you just notice it and you sit there and you're aware of how you feel about it. And those t that, that, that little practice is very powerful. So folks, that's it. That's kind of everything I've learned over six years about the thing. And it's very, very transformative. Oh